Welcome uh, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming down. Uh, we have uh, Sire Saab with us today. He comes from a literary family uh, in the local context and ha has written poetry in both English and Sindhi. His first poetry book in Sindhi was awarded by was awarded the best poetry book of the year by the Sindhi Graduates Association. He has also received an award uh, from the University of Surrey in 2008. Uh, he has written he has written on social and literary criticism. And uh, his first English poetry book is Silence of the Piano Sings, uh, about which he will be talking to us today and about his experiences. So, Sarah Sarah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> It has to be about uh, Ayat. Should I close it? Or okay. Okay. No, no, so. uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, I think. Uh, lady and gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, <coughs> it's, an, it's a point of an honor for me to be here. Actually, I'm based in Pakistan and uh, came here for a certain number of things to do. And I'm thankful to Ayaz, Oxford Pakistan Society, and even especially uh, the alumni, Imran Qureshi. Uh, he's a very gen good gentleman. So thanks for inviting me here. It's an honor. Now I hope uh, we start the lecture and we'll enjoy it together. This is uh, basically uh, who will be uh, I'll be changing it. Okay. Uh, this is the outlook of the book. Two pages: the front page and the back page. So the cover pages, in a way. How does the book look like? I think uh, we move ahead. This is a schema. Now in this schema, what I have uh, sort of speaking on is about uh, where this book of mine at present stands. And in order to know that, we have to go across centuries in order to just understand the little bit of the past and then compare what is in the present and what then this book presents to you or us. So we'll move through these, first of all, historical perspectives, these movements, and then we will look at the present era and the tensions in poetic theories and poetic understanding. And finally we move to the book and its uh, two parts, poetry and the preface. Now this is uh, <clears throat> what we have, the history of classicism. The classicism is specifically connected to Greece. And major classical poets and even other literary figures, you know, have come from Greece like Sappho, Aristophanes, Sophocles, Euripides, Pindar and many more. And that is why people ascribe classicism to Greece. In order to understand the present scenario, we have to see how the poetic evolution took place across the centuries. Now, this is the Dionysian theatre. It is one of the very important theatres in the world. This was a, perhaps the first theatre in the world where literary programs were arranged, especially uh, the rhetoricians, the rhetoricians of the past. Because you know, Greeks were famous for rhetorics. So the rhetorical work or the rhetorics were mainly presented in Dionysian theatre. Even the scholars like Sophocles, who wrote dramas, Aeschylus, and Euripides uh, normally competed and they presented their work in this theatre. And that is why I have put it here. These are the classicism elements. And these elements, you know, how we understand classicism? We understand through these elements. Actually, the classicists, everybody knows that it was not prose, but poetry, that it started every literature in any, every language. It has been agreed by almost all of the scholars were across. They used to write dramas, but all the dramas used to be in 
poetry in verse. They believed that since poetry is an art, it should be in a proper manner. The depiction of poetry, the content of poetry, the form of poetry, whether there's meter or something, uh, the style of poetry, you have to be, you have to follow all of the rules, barring none, no exclusion. So, for this purpose, these scholars provided certain number of rules and regulations. Aristotle provided, uh, uh, wrote a book, Poetics. Then there was a writer, Longinus. We'll come to that. He wrote a book on the sublime. And through these books, we have come across a number of things about the Greek poetic regulations and rules. They were quite boring in a way for the newcomers, but in those times it was very important. If you do not follow these rules, you are out of the poetic structure. Now these are again two scholars. And one scholar, and he was the greatest poet of the times. He wrote this Odyssey, but there has been a debate on the question as to whether it is Homer who was one person who wrote the Odyssey and Elite. A number of scholars have also said that there have been Homer's, a, a series of you know poets with the same name, because of the diction. The diction in one part of that, if you read that, I've read that you know Odyssey in one chapter, one book, second book, they didn't have chapters in those times, they had the books, one book, second book. You will find different kind of diction, different kind of style. As a result, you can't, you know, connect all of them. But nonetheless, he's one of the greatest uh, classical poets. Then we have uh, Aeschylus. Aeschylus is the first Greek poet who wrote dramas. He wrote 17 dramas. Out of them, seven are intact. Uh, fortunately, I have read all those seven dramas. Prometheus Bound is one of the most famous of his works. And you must relate it to P.B. Shelley's Prometheus Unbound, which he wrote being inspired by his work. He also participated as a competitor in the Dionysian theatre. No, 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 then we have Euripides and Sophocles. Sophocles was uh, and Euripides both were the uh, dramatic poets like Aeschylus and they wrote poetry with a lot of good stuff from the Greek mythology, Greek traditions and they also competed. Sophocles was the one who always stood one, number one and he was, you know, enviable in those times. Then we have Aristophanes, he was a comic writer basically. He wrote dramas full of uh, comics and humor. Though humor was not available in those times, humor is the product of later stages. Uh, they were comedians in a way. Sappho is thought to be, she belongs to Lesbos. She belonged to Lesbos and uh, she wrote poetry and she's in chronology thought to be the first woman to write poetry. Aristotle called her the tenth muse. We have nine muses the daughters of Zeus, the, uh, the god of sun. Uh, so she was also the classical poetess. Now we have these two uh, major books on criticism. What I as told earlier is poetics, Aristotle's poetics. Aristotle speaks basically on how tragedy is to initiate and then to end. And for this purpose, he gave a lot of rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations went on for centuries until William Shakespeare came on the front. He almost broke all of the unity he provided and as a result was condemned by French critics that he cannot be a playwright, he cannot be a dramatist, he cannot be a poet who criticizes Aristotle. But again, uh, history tells us that Shakespeare was right in what he did by breaking the rules that Aristotle made. But again, it is one of the best parts of uh, the literature, Greek 
classical literature. Then we have uh, this uh, on the sublime, Longinus, one of the greatest writers. He is basically described in this book two things that poets basically have on the one hand passion which is inborn. He believes in inborn passion. You can't create it. And on the other side you have art as an external support. If you are inborn, uh, uh, you are an inborn poet and then you should take support of art, then you can be a good poet. If either of the things is missing, you can't be. This way we have the classical literature. In reaction to this literature, we have Romanticism that appeared in 1798. It was a date, it was a year of the publication of Lyrical Ballads, written by William Wordsworth and his friend Coleridge, S.T. Coleridge, Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coleridge. They basically, you know, believe that it's too much that we have been following the rules and regulations along the lines, along the centuries. But what about the passion? What about the emotions, the sentiments which a writer has? Because the classicist believed that you have to keep restraints on your emotions. If you do not do that, there won't be objectivity. They said that if we keep our emotions restrained, how can we express ourselves in a complete independent way. And that was why they wrote a revolutionary book, this lyrical ballad, uh, which became the uh, cornerstone, milestone towards romanticism. One of the examples, now these romantics here, they believed in imagination. Wherever the imagination goes, alpha to omega, give it the space. Let it work like anything. And one of the examples we have of Horus, the, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. There is a voyage wherein a people, a number of people go and they come across a number of problems. They lose their track and finally a supernatural character in shape of, in shape of albatross, a bird, which is now uh, I think uh, dangerous species, or I think it is, you can't find it. <laughs> Anyways, Albatross came supernaturally and then he guided them and supported them. You will find the element of supernatural, imagination, which goes beyond the boundaries which these kind of classicists could never support. And uh, you can see. When you focus on your emotions, imagination, supernatural, then it has to be related to intuition as well. And when you take that side, naturally the reason, the rules, the regulation, the objectivity, get another side. So you have subjective elements in your poetry. They're totally subjective. And what you give is called romantic. Romantic is about the inner. These are the writers like B.B. Shelley, B. B. Keats and Shelley, they, they died in very early age. Uh, Shelley died in 29 years and he died in 28, 27. And this goes on with those great writers. We have basically six romantic poets who are the prominent poets. But apart from English, if you go around the world and you will find a number of scholars, number of poets, number of critics. From France we have Baudelaire, great poet, and he also supported Romanticism. Likewise, we have Alexander Pushkin, he was a Russian poet, perhaps uh, counted to be the best Russian poet of all times. From uh, France again, Gauthier, and from Germany, Goethe. These uh, Romantics world around because this was a movement which was going around. It started uh, in, in England, then in France, you find it in Italy, you find it in uh, other places, but not America especially, because it was not the right time for the Americans in those uh, years. These are the highlights if we want to understand what the Romantics believed in.
They believed in the language of common layman use. They separated the high toned ornate kind of fiction from the simple language. Uh, lyrical ballads is one of them. And even all of the words, like if you go to a verse called Prelude, if you read the Prometheus Unbound by Shelley, if you read uh, the Autumn by Keats, or whatever, from Robert Browning, from Lord Byron, or a number of uh, poets of those types, you will find the language in a very simple mode. You will enjoy it. But again, they used to have tendency to use the past material. But that past material mostly was used from Greece. So this Greek tradition is known as Hellenism. So they were most of the times Hellenistic. If you uh, take the example of Prometheus and Baal, so there is a story of Prometheus, basically from Greek mythology of God. So again, he was inspired by Aeschylus, as we discussed earlier. And having been inspired, he wrote him uh, the, the story from a romantic angle. The, Aeschylus, uh, the, the Prometheus bound by Aeschylus was a story of the God from rules and regulations where there, there was important element of ethics. But when Shelley writes about the same thing, he speaks about the passion. He, he speaks about rebellion against the God and as a result, we have uh, emotion full, full of emotions, poetry. Now these, uh, I think I, I didn't finish it. Now, this is how we can understand realism. They claim, we try to show to the world what it is. Like with classicists believe or claimed that we try to show something of higher order. These romantics believe that we try to say what our heart says to us, that it should be. So it is most of the time subjective. It is more subjective. If we uh, take example of the glass full of water, we normally we give it as an optimism, realism and pessimism. If we look at half glass of water, if it is half filled and half empty, if we look at it from this angle, it is what we speak about realism. And if we say that it is half filled, only half filled, we are basically referring to the romantics. Classicism doesn't come there. Anyway. <clears throat> now this is the, the third movement. Now classicists, you know, uh, uh, every, almost every literature believes we have classical writers. I am speaking right now about the classicism where it started. Otherwise, if you look at English literature, the classical uh, era is almost before Shakespeare and even after Shakespeare. But in world history, we have classicism starting in Greece. Coming from that angle, if we come to the uh, uh, 1798, uh, almost the 19th century, we have Romanticism. Then we have the modern era that basically starts by the end of the 19th century. It is almost 1890 and then it moves on till 1950-1960. This is the period of 50, 60, 65 years. It can never be your water type from half centuries are like. Modernists, they were in a way opposed to, on the one hand, Romanticism, and on the other hand, the Victorian era. Victorians, well, you know, uh, the Queen Victoria, when she lived, she had almost brought a lot of industrial revolution. And due to that, there were a number of theories and books and ideas within the minds of the people, like uh, Karl Marx's book, that was in that time, 1800, 88, 68, 68, 68, uh, 88. Uh, and again, uh, Origin of the Species, 1857, by your, was a great man, Charles Darwin, and the like. The people had a lot of doubts about society, doubts about ethics, doubts about religion, 
and even doubts about poetry. It was the time again of rules and regulation, though there was creativity. But again, these people said, we do not want to follow what you have been following for long. And what they presented, we will look at it. First of them, who became, uh, in a way, flag holders of modernism, were the imagists. You have, must have heard imagism. It was basically used by Azra Lumis Paul. He was an American poet, and he said that an imagery, imagery is what? Imagery, it's, it's uh, separate from an image. But when you are telling something in a descriptive style, whereby a picture comes to your mind, and then has a lasting effect, and when this works, you are basically referring to an imagery. As our poem said, one imagery is better than 1,000 poems. So he started writing imagery, and the way those images started working, we have the era of modernism. You can look at this. This is a verse, basically two lines, total poem, by Ezra Lewis Paul. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bar. This is how you, you just uh, create things, images like things. But these images did not get support uh, as a proper movement for modernism. They were supported by symbolists, those who believed in symbolism. They said, we will go towards symbolism. What was that symbolism? We have those writers like Malam and W.B. Yates. They said that since those romantics and those Victorian poets believed in their heart and the emotions and subjectivity, okay, well, but we focus on something which is simple but has a number of different meanings with it. Symbolism. They believe that the world had become quite complex and quite complicated due to a number of reasons. So the poetry should also present something which is not which has not to be simple. Because if you want to give something, try to give something which can encompass a number of ideas in the same poem, for instance. This way you will be providing much in a lower space. This could only be possible if there was symbolism. Now, we have the, I think, the protagonist of all these uh, issues leading to modernism, T.S. Eliot. They believed T.S. Eliot, you know, belonged to America, basically, but he stayed in London as well. As we have Walt Whitman, Walt Whitman was an American poet. Uh, uh, these two poets, yes, sir, please. These two poets supported realism on the one hand. On the other hand, they support, uh, supported uh, the symbolists. And apart from that, all these modernist poets believe in a few things. Number one. We are individuals, and individuality is more important than anything. We can do anything we want. Freedom of choice. I'm not referring to existentialism here. Freedom of choice, freedom of expression, and whatever subject matter we want to choose, we can choose. We will not be following just the heart in a way as romantics used to. We will see in a number of other sites, uh, first have a look of these core, uh, poets first of all. James Joyce and W.H. Oren. W.H. Oren was from America. James Joyce, you well know, from England. And these two poets and other poets, they just avoided all kind of the pompous and ornate language in the past and even in the romantic time. Now, we have a great book of The Waste Plan. It was a monument, I think. Magnum Opus by T.S. Eliot. Waste Plan is a combination of five poems, which are totally separate from each other, are all giving different ideas, 
and when you combine them, you have a different kind of poetic picture. This is called, this was called in those times collage technique, which T. S. Eliot, you know, adopted in the West Bank. Basically, this was the time when First World War, even Second World War, these in these 60, 65 years span of time uh, occurred, which led to a lot of chaos across the world. And as a, as a result, these people believed we should have something of our own. Of our own, we should have identity. This issue of identity, this issue of individualism, this issue of uh, simple language, symbolism, imagery, uh, led to the modernism as a cherished idea in those times. But afterwards, uh, movement starts, which continues to now. We are living in poetic terms in the postmodern world. This starts from 1960 onwards, but you can never, you know, uh, give it a proper date. But some believe it is 1960, others believe in 1955, and so on. But again, at present, we are living in postmodern world. Unless somebody in future, as a critic, finds out a number of elements here and there and says that no, you are living in another age. You didn't know. It's quite possible. Because the classicists didn't know that they were classicists. It is a critic, or it, they are, it is a crit mainly the critic, critic, or the future ages. Who we'll, we'll decide that which kind of age it was? Postmodern. Now, basically, these two uh, groups of uh, poets in America, the Black Mountain poets and the Beat Generation, they uh, basically started to give something new to the world. What was new? We'll look at uh, in, the, in the coming slides. They believed in iconoclasm breaking the rules and the idols of everything. Now, look at this. They decolonized the previous artworks, previous authorities, and uh, they speak on the text rather than the context. For instance, they believe that the old poets like modernists and even uh, the romantic, they thought themselves of as uh, the heroes Superman, and they wanted to give something to the world. Every man's sentence was the sentence for the whole mankind. Without any research, they just spoke it. I mean, this is quite a different kind of poetry. When I came first, uh, first time I first uh, came across it, it was quite different for me to understand it. I mean, it doesn't look like poetry. Anyway, they said, first of all, there is not an issue of identity or the issue of believing that you are the sole acknowledgers of the issues of the mankind, please remove that idea. Now, nobody is the author of everything. You just present your own ideas about the minor things, not the bigger issues. Because by highlighting the bigger issues, you are basically telling to the world that you are the one who is the judge, the best out of it, and who you are the one who should be followed by all of the people who are reading your poetry. So this is how they said that we do not want that. They took context. Basically, the postmodern poets believe in the text. Normally, if you go uh, to the 19th century or in the first half of the, half of the 20th century, you will find.